Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. It's a real honor to be the, the first speaker in the session and the 219th speaker in the Number Theory Web Seminar. So um, the work I'm going to talk about today is joint with Martin Bright. Um, and my setup is that L is going to be a number field and X will be a nice variety over L. So by nice, I mean smooth, projective and geometrically irreducible. And I'm interested in studying the rational points on X over L. So we do this by embedding in them in the set Vedelic points, which since X is projective, this is just the product over all the places V of L of the points on X over the completion of L at the place V. So if L were the rational numbers, this would be the product of the real points with the piadic points for every prime P. And the embedding is just because L sits inside all its completions. So we can view a rational point as like a piadic point for any prime p. Okay, so in particular, if I have a rational point on x over L, then I have points everywhere locally. In other words, an adelic point on x. And the question is, what about going the other way? So if I have points um, everywhere locally, I mean points over all these completions of L, do I actually have to have a rational point on x over L? If so, then we say the Hasse principle holds. And this is the first example of a local global principle that I wanted to give. Um, and for example, the Hasse principle holds for varieties cut, about, cut out by quadratic forms. That's the Hasse and Kowski theorem. The second example of a local global principle I want to discuss is weak approximation. So when you study the rational points on a variety, um, your first question is, are there any? And then if you know that there are some, you might be interested in kind of how many uh, points you have. Are they abundant in, in some way? Um, so one way of measuring that is to ask whether weak approximation holds. So weak approximation is said to hold if the rational points are dense in the adelic points. So dense with respect to the product of all these um, viadic topologies. Okay, so then if we're interested in understanding rational points, we should be interested in understanding these local global principles and in particular understanding if they fail, why they fail. So a common reason for failure of these local global principles is given by the brow manin obstruction. This is an obstruction coming from the Brouwer group of X, so it's this group, um, this second tetal cohomology group attached to X. But if this is not a familiar object for you, then don't really worry too much about what the group is. The important thing is what it does for us. So what kind of properties does it have? Well, first of all, you can evaluate elements of the Brouwer group at points. So suppose I have a local point PV over some field LV, then I can evaluate an element of the Brouwer group at that point and obtain uh, something in the brow group of the field LV. So that's just by functoriality. But brow groups of local fields like LV are pretty simple. So if, if V is a finite prime, then the Hasse invariant gives a canonical isomorphism from the brow group of LV to the rationals modulo the integers. And what about the infinite places? Well, the brow group of any algebraically closed field, like the complex numbers, is trivial. And the Brouwer group of the reals is cyclic of order two. So uh, the non-trivial class is given by the quaternions. And I've written my cyclic um, group of order two as a half Z mod Z. Like usually you'd write this as Z mod two, but I want to see this uh, group as lying inside the rationals modulo the integers. That's why I wrote it in this funny way. So Manin's key observation was that you can sum up these invariants and obtain a pairing, which takes in uh, an adelic point. So that's a collection of local points and an element of the Brouwer group. And it spits out a number in the rationals modulo the integers. So what do you do? You take your element A in the Brouwer group, you evaluate A at each of these points PV. You take the Hasse invariant that gives you something in the rationals modulo the integers. Turns out that um, all but finitely many of these are zero. So you can actually form this sum and get a number. But the, the key point here is that this pairing cuts out a subset of the adelic points 
which contains the closure of the rational points. So this so-called brown manner set, which I've written here as uh, the adelic points with a superscript bra x, this means the adelic points that pair to zero with everything in the Brouwer group. And so if you have points everywhere locally, i.e. you have an adelic point, but there's nothing in the brown manner set, then because the rational points are contained in the brown manner set, the set of rational points must be empty as well. And in this case, we say there's a Brown-Mannin obstruction to the Hasse principle because it's the emptiness of the Brown-Mannin set which is forcing the set of rational points to be empty. The Brow group can also uh, obstruct weak approximation. So if the Brown-Mannin set is not equal to the full set of adelic points, well then, again, recalling that the closure of the rational points is contained in the brown manin set. Well, if this brown manin set is smaller than the full set of adelic points, then the closure of the rational points is contained in a smaller set. So the rational points are not dense in the set of adelic points. In this case, we say there's a brown manin obstruction to weak approximation. Okay, so from now on in my talk, I'm always going to assume that my variety X has points everywhere locally, an adelic point. Otherwise, there's no rational points, there's nothing to study and we can all go home. So now I'm gonna define kind of uh, another kind of brown manin set just for one element in the brow group. So if I take one element in the brow group, I can define in the same way, uh, a set which I'll denote with a superscript A, meaning the set of adelic points which pair to zero with A. So just to remind you, we had um, that the closure of the rational points is contained in the brown manin set, which is the points that pair to zero with everything in the brow group. And those are, of course, contained in the adelic points which pair to zero with just A. So we have this chain of inclusions. Okay. <clears throat> so you can see that, for example, if um, this brown manin set for A is empty, then the set of rational points has to be empty. And then we would say that A obstructs the Hazard principle. If this uh, brown manner set for A is not equal to the full set of adelic points, then again, it contains the closure of the rational points. And we would say that it obstructs weak approximation. OK, so I want some notation for the map that I get by um, taking uh, a point on X over some LV and evaluating A at that point to land in the Brow group of LV. So I just write that as A, but with bars around it. So now some observations. If this evaluation map is non-constant for just a single place V, then um, the adelic points that pair to zero with A is not equal to the full set of adelic points. In other words, A obstructs weak approximation because this um, brown manin set for A contains the closure of the rational points. So they can't be dense. Okay, so how do we how do we see that? So I'm trying to prove that these two sets aren't equal. So I need to find some adelic point which doesn't pair to zero with A. So that'll be an adelic point which is not in the brown manin set for A. OK, so I just take some uh, arbitrary adelic point. It's a collection of local points. I might get lucky, and when I pair it with A, I might get something non-zero. Then I'm done. The only issue is if I happen to get zero. So here I wrote down the pairing. So I've taken A, I've evaluated at all these points, taken the invariance, summed them up. If I'm unlucky enough to get zero, well, then I can use the fact that at this single place V, the evaluation map is non-constant to destroy this equality. Okay, so I can I can replace um, the entry at the place V, which was some PV, with another point QV, which gives has a different evaluation and therefore a different invariant. So if I had this sum equaling zero, and then I just change one of the entries, it will no longer equal zero. So I've found something. I found uh, an adelic point which doesn't pair to zero with A. I hope that's clear. So similarly, suppose my element in the Brow group has order n, and that means that 
It's a valuation map. We'll take uh, values in the n torsion of the Brouwer group. And I'm supposing here that V is finite. So the n torsion in the rationals modulo the integers is like one over n z mod z. So if this if this evaluation map subjects onto that group, so the image is as big as it could be, then um, the kind of brown minus set for A, so the elements that pair to zero uh, with A is non-empty. In other words, A does not obstruct the Hasse principle. So this is proved in a very similar way to the first observation. And if you're bored in the talk, you can do that exercise. But okay, what I want you to take away from this uh, slide is that sometimes just understanding the evaluation map very well at a single place can tell you a lot about um, brown manning obstructions to weak approximation and the house principle. So that's kind of gonna be the theme of this talk, understanding these evaluation maps and when they're constant um, and when they're not. Okay, so for the next part, I need to introduce some more notation. Uh, S is going to be a set which contains the Archimedean primes of L and the primes of bad reduction for X. And then I have a necessary technical assumption that the geometric Picard group is torsion free. So in this context, Swinnerton Dyer asked the following question. Yes, is there an open and closed set Z contained in the product over just uh, the primes in S of the local points um, on X over LV for V and S? such that the Brahman set has the following description. It's Z times the product of the full set of local points for primes away from S. So in other words, it's asking whether the Brahman set only has conditions imposed on it at the primes in S. So this is essentially asking um, whether the evaluation maps are just constant for all primes outside S. Again, if you're bored, you can think a bit about why those things are essentially the same. Um, informally, what we're asking is, does the Brahman obstruction involve only the Archimedean primes and the primes of bad reduction? Okay, so those are the only ones kind of showing up in the description of the Brahman and set here, primes in S. So the first step towards answering this question was given by uh, theorem of Kolyotelen and Skorobogatov. So with the same necessary assumption, the geometric Picard group is torsion free. And assuming that the so-called transcendental part of the brow group, which is this image of the brow group inside the brow group of X now considered over an algebraic closure of the base field. So if that's finite, then the only primes that can play a role in the brow and obstruction are the ones suggested by Swinton Dyer, the Archimedean primes and the primes of bad reduction, and possibly the primes dividing the size of this so-called transcendental part of the bra group, the size of this image. So in particular, if this image is trivial, then the answer to Swinton Dyer's question is yes. You only need the Archimedean primes and the primes of bad reduction to tell you everything about Brahman and obstructions. However, um, in the work with Martin Bright, we showed that, in fact, the answer to Swinnerton Dyer's question is no in general. So um, we showed that if X admits a non-zero global two form, then every prime of good ordinary reduction is involved in a Brownian obstruction over some finite extension of the base field. Okay, so... Um, more precisely, what do I mean by this? So let's take a prime frac P lying above some rational prime little p of good ordinary reduction. Then there exists a finite extension of the base field, L prime. A prime in this extension lying above our original prime and an element in the Brouwer group of X now considered as a variety over that extension um, of order a power of p such that the evaluation map is non-constant. And we saw that non-constant evaluation map gives automatically, even just at one place, gives automatically an obstruction to weak approximation. So in particular, 
um, our result shows that the answer to Swinton Dyer's question can be no, even for K3 surfaces over number fields. So K3 surfaces over number fields satisfy this um, condition. If I start with a K3 surface over a number field and a good ordinary prime, and then I take an extension of the base field, well, I've still, after a finite extension, I've still got a number field. So I've still got a K3 surface over a number field, but now I've got some good prime involved in the brown man abstraction. Whereas Swinton Dyer was suggesting that perhaps it would only be Archimedean primes and, and bad primes. Okay, but here we allowed extensions of the base field. What happens if we don't allow that? Okay, so if we really fix X and we fix its base field, then we could ask um, a similar question. Is there a finite set S of primes that can be involved in the brown man abstraction? So we know that this can involve some good primes, but can we explicitly describe the set of primes involved in the abstraction? So the answer to this question is yes. So with Martin Bright, we showed, um, again, with this um, necessary assumption, there's a finite set of primes such that outside of S, for primes outside of S, um, all the evaluation maps for all elements of the Brow group are constant. And we can describe that set S. So in S, you have to have the Archimedean primes and the primes of bad reduction. So these are the usual suspects um, given by Swinnerton and Dyer. Then we, we include all primes satisfying the following condition on the ramification index. So here again, frac P is, um, frac P is uh, a prime in L. It lies above some rational prime, little p. And this EP is the absolute ramification index. So we're asking that EP is at least P minus one. So for odd primes, this already says that the prime should ramify in your in your number field. And the fourth set is primes for which uh, the special fiber admits um, a non-zero global two four. Okay. So let's let's see what this theorem says in the case of K three surfaces over the rationals. Okay. So I claim. But for a K3 surface over the rationals, the only primes that can play a role in Brahmanian abstractions are um, the infinite prime, two, and the primes of bad reduction. So in other words, the only kind of extra prime on top of what Swinnerton and Dyer predicted could be two. Outside of this set, all the evaluation maps are constant. Okay, so to prove this, we have to, to prove that this is a corollary of theorem five, we have to look at these sets of primes Archimedean prime, okay, we included infinity. Primes of bad reduction, we included them. So we have to look at sets three and four. Okay. So in our setting, we're over the rationals. So all the absolute ramification indices are one. Nothing ramifies in the, the rationals over itself. So the only way we could have... Uh, this inequality being satisfied is if p equals two. So that's why two shows up. Okay, so for all odd primes, the ramification index is one, and that's strictly less than p minus one for an odd prime p. But two could be involved, so we throw in two. And then we have to go to the fourth set. Um, but okay, um, we have nothing in the fourth set to add. Because for K3 surfaces, K3 surfaces um, don't emit non-zero global one form. And if P is a prime of good reduction, remember we've already included all the primes of bad reduction. So if P is a good prime, then the special fiber is also a K3 surface. And hence, this is zero. So there's nothing in the fourth set. Okay, so only two could possibly give some uh, counter example to um, Swinton Dyer's question for K3 surfaces over the rational. But um, so far we didn't show that it actually does, right? We just show that every, all the other evaluation maps are constant. We haven't shown that it's non-constant too. So um, this was solved by Margarita Pagano who gave the following example. So this is, this is an example that shows that the answer to Swinnerton Dyer's question about which primes can play a role in the brown abstraction um, can be no, even for a K3 surface over the rationals. 
And of course, in that setting, we know that the only possibility um, for, an, <clears throat> for a good prime to play a role is two, and that's indeed what she shows. So she exhibits this K3 surface and this element in its Brouwer group. She shows that two is a prime of good reduction for X, and yet its evaluation map is not constant. All right, so now in the second part of the talk, I want to um, talk about how we prove things like theorem five. You know, we want to prove that if we take a prime outside S, the evaluation map is constant. But that becomes just a local problem. I can fix my, my arbitrary prime um, outside S, and I want to just know about the evaluation map at that prime. So, okay. Then I might as well, uh, so I can view everything over um, LP. L was my number field, P was my prime. I take the completion and I get a piadic field. So I get some finite extension of piadic numbers and I'll call that little k. But you can think of little k as LP if you want. But from now on, we're doing a completely local calculation. So this is a piadic field. I've written pi for the uniformizer, bold f for the residue field, and now I'm considering X as a smooth geometrically irreducible variety over K with smooth model curly X over the ring of integers. Remember that P was outside S, which includes all the bad primes. So I have a smooth model. And why is it special fiber, which is assumed to be geometrically irreducible? Okay, so that's the local setting. So what do we know about evaluation maps? Okay, so if I have, um, I suppose I have a, a, a point Q, um, it's a, a K point of X, or of some piadic field, which extends to an integral point on the model. And I'm gonna write Q zero for the reduction of Q to the special fiber. So uh, Q zero is like the reduction of Q mod pi, if you want. Then I have a following uh, commutative diagram. So here I've written P prime to denote the prime to P torsion in the Brow group. The Brow group of a nice variety is a torsion group. So let's look at its prime to P part. So I'm evaluating A at the point Q here. This is our evaluation map. So that gives me a map to the Brow group of the piadic field K. And then we have a residue map to H1 of the residue field. This is a finite field, F. And this is actually an isomorphism. So this is all classical stuff. Um, there's also a residue map on the top of this diagram, which takes values in H1 of the special fiber. And then I have an evaluation map. So I can evaluate at the point Q0, which lies on Y, this reduction mod pi of our original point. So the fact that this diagram commutes, the key takeaway is that um, if I have an element of order co prime to P in the Brouwer group of X, then it's evaluation at a piadic point Q, so a K point Q, only depends on the reduction of that point mod pi. Because this is the reduction map, but I can alternatively go the other way around the diagram, okay? So if I had Q and another point R, which both reduce to Q0 mod pi, then when I go this way around the diagram, I see that I get the same evaluation. Only depends on Q0. Okay, but things get interesting when you look at elements of order P or a power of P, because this is no longer true in that setting. So if my element A was order P or a power of P, then it's evaluation at a K point does not necessarily just depend on its reduction mod pi, but might depend on its reduction mod pi squared or mod pi cubed or mod some higher power of pi. So we need to know um, our point to a higher degree of piadic accuracy in order to evaluate A at that point. So in the work with Martin, 
We classified elements of the Brouwer group according to the periodic accuracy needed to evaluate them. So this gives a filtration on the Brouwer group called the evaluation filtration. Okay, and we write Fn for, its, for the pieces in this filtration. And n here starts from minus one, which is, seems a bit of a funny numbering, but it's chosen for ease of comparison with another filtration later on. Okay, so what's the definition? Um, so the nth piece of the evaluation filtration consists of elements whose evaluation factors through reduction mod pi to the n plus one. Okay, so when n equals zero, that's saying elements whose evaluation factors through reduction mod pi. So that includes all um, the elements in the Brow group of order co prime to p. And when n equals minus one, this is just saying that uh, f minus one is the elements with constant evaluation. So it doesn't even depend on what the point is, is mod pi, it's just independent of the point. Okay. So in our work, what we did was to relate the evaluation filtration to um, Carter's filtration by Swan conductor. So this is a much more uh, general filtration uh, defined by Carter, but I'm only gonna talk about it in the context of the Brow group, and I'm not gonna define it in this talk because it's a bit technical. But let me just label the pieces of Carter's filtration fill n, for n at least zero. So what kind of properties does this filtration have? Well, it's an increasing filtration, the smallest piece is fill zero. And Carter was able to extend the residue map to give a residue map on the whole of fill zero. Okay, so fill zero contains the elements of order co prime to p, but it also contains some elements of order of power of p. Um, okay, so we've got an extension of the residue map to the whole of fill zero. Okay, what about fill one, fill two, et cetera. There we can't extend the residue map anymore, but alternatively, um, as an alternative to the residue map, which doesn't extend, Cato defines something which he calls the refined swan conductor. So this is an injective homomorphism on the graded pieces. So for n at least one, you have a graded piece in this filtration. It's an injective homomorphism to a sum of differentials. So we usually write um, alpha comma beta for the refined swan conductor at level n of a. Alpha here is a, a two form on the special fiber and beta is a one form. Okay. So a key property that we'll come back to a few times uh, later on is that if alpha and beta, if alpha comma beta is the refined swan conductor at level n of some element a in the nth piece of Carter's filtration, then Carter shows that n times alpha equals the beta. Okay, so here's our comparison statement. So this is um, from the work with Bright. We showed that for n at least one, the nth piece of our evaluation filtration consists of those elements in the n plus one piece of Carter's filtration whose refined swan conductor at level n plus one has beta equals zero. So it has just zero in the second entry. It's supposed to have something in omega two, comma something in omega one, and we actually just have beta. For, sorry, we have just zero for beta. At level zero, they're equal on the nose. So F zero was the elements uh, whose evaluation factors through reduction mod pi and fill zero is the part where you can define the residue map, which is what we saw in this commutative diagram um, where we saw that uh, um, evaluation maps only depend on the reduction to the special fiber. Then F minus one, this is the constant stuff. So it's elements of the Brow group whose evaluation map is just constant. So uh, this is smaller than F zero. So it's things in fill zero where we have the residue map defined and we want, so the residue map now, uh, the, um, the evaluation map factors via the residue map, which normally takes values in H1 of the special fiber Y, 
But we're asking for the evaluation to be constant. So in fact, F minus one turns out to be the ones uh, where the residue map uh, just lands in H1 of F, which is this finite field. This is just constant. So, yeah, um, this looks a bit funny, right? These two filtrations are equal on the nose at level zero. And then at level N, I'm comparing the nth piece of the evaluation filtration with um, some things in the M plus oneth part of Cato's filtration. But actually, it turns out that um, most of the time, the nth piece of the evaluation filtration is just equal to the nth piece of Cato's filtration. So this thing on the right-hand side is usually just equal to Cato's fill N of brow X. So that's what I'll show on the next page. So the claim is that this, this thing that was from the right-hand side and actually we show is equal to the nth piece in the evaluation filtration always contains fill N and this, is an, this containment is an equality if P doesn't divide N plus one. Okay, so let's prove that. Um, okay, so we had this refined swan conductor. We're now taking it at level N plus one. It's an injective map on this graded piece on the quotient of the N plus one part of the filtration by the nth piece into this sum of differentials. Okay, so if I start with something in fill n plus one, then just because this uh, map is injective, A actually is in the bottom here. Uh, it's in fill n if and only if it's refined swan conductor at level n plus one is zero. Okay. Precisely um, because this map is injective. So, well, then if things in field zero have swan conductor with alpha and beta both equaling zero, 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 they certainly lie in this set where I'm only asking beta to be zero. So I've now shown this containment. And the second part of the proof, I'll show equality if P doesn't divide N plus one. Okay, so let's write alpha comma beta for the refined swan conductor at level n plus one of a. So now our relation, because we're taking the refined swan conductor at level n plus one, the relation is that n plus one times alpha equals d beta. Okay, now alpha and beta, um, these are differential forms on y, which was the special fiber, which it's, lives in characteristic p. So it's important here that P doesn't divide n plus one. So if P doesn't divide n plus one, well then if beta is zero, so we're in this right hand side, we're asking for the second entry to be zero, then d beta is clearly zero. That means n plus one times alpha equals zero. But if P doesn't divide n plus one, we can invert it and find that alpha equals zero. So then that's how we showed that if P doesn't divide N plus one, then as soon as I insist for beta to be zero, I get alpha equals zero. And having swan conductor zero, zero at level N plus one precisely means I'm in fill N, which is what I wanted to show. I hope that's clear. Okay. So um, how did we prove our comparison result? So, to prove it, we looked at the variation of these evaluation maps on uh, periodic disks. So let's define our periodic disks. Let's take um, uh, an integral point on the model, P, and we'll define um, the ball BPN as the integral points Q, which look like P mod pi to the N. So reduced to the same thing mod pi to the N. So then, then we showed that if we take an element A in the nth piece of Cato's filtration and we write alpha comma beta for its refined swan conductor at level N, then the evaluation map varies linearly on this periodic disk 
and is controlled by beta at P0. Okay, and if, if beta is zero, then um, this evaluation map is just constant on that disk, but it varies quadratically on larger disks and there it's controlled by alpha at P0. So I'm gonna state the first part of this statement more precisely. So more precisely, if I have um, a point Q in this uh, disk of uh, points which are congruent to P mod pi to the N, then after choosing some affine coordinates on some, some neighborhood, I can write Q as P plus pi to the N times some vector written in my coordinates. Okay, And then I'll define this, uh, this kind of um, vector PQ to be this vector mod pi. So this is something um, in the tangent space to the special fiber at the point P0. Okay. And so what does our statement actually say? It says that for such a point, when we compute its invariant, so we evaluate at Q, we compute the uh, invariant, that's equal to the invariant of A evaluated at P plus this uh, kind of linear term here. So here I've got beta at P0, that's something in the um, in the cotangent space. So I can pair it with um, something in the tangent space at P0 of Y. Okay, and I'll get um, an element in um, the field F. So this is uh, the, the field over which Y is defined, it's the residue field. Okay, and then I can take the trace of that thing and uh, I land in the finite field FP. So now there's something a little funny in this notation, right? Because I've got something like in FP, which I'm, I'm, I, I can view it as uh, being in, in Z mod PZ. And then I'm like, <laughs> I've got something in, in, in kind of characteristic P and I'm writing one over P, what, what does this mean? This is, um, this is just uh, because do you remember at the beginning when I was dealing with the um, the Hassett invariant um, at a real place, I had like, oh, you know, the the Brow group is order two, but I'll write it as half Z mod Z instead of uh, Z mod two, because I want to see um, all my invariants as landing in the rationals mod the, the integers. So here I've got something in like FP, which I can see as Z mod PZ. And then when I write one over P, what I mean is, take Z mod PZ and transform it into one over P Z mod Z. One over P times the integers modulo the integers, the P torsion in the rationals mod the, modulo the integers. Okay, but in particular, if uh, uh, beta P0 is non-zero, then um, I can get something non-zero here, and then I can scale and see that I get P values on this periodic disk. So finally, um, in the last few minutes, I want to say something about the proof of this theorem five. So this was, this was the theorem where we say outside of this set S, all the evaluation maps are constant. Okay, so let's try to prove it. So let me take a prime outside S and let me try to show that all evaluation maps are constant. So now again, I'll view um, my variety X as a variety over LP for the completion of LP. And I want to now show that um, my Brouwer group, this variety, that all the evaluation maps of every element in this Brouwer group are constant. But F minus one was defined to be those elements in the Brouwer group with constant evaluation map. Okay, so this is the equality I'm trying to show. And I'll do it in two steps. The first step is to show that everything is in Cato's field zero. And the second step is to show that everything in Cato's field, field zero uh, is in F minus one in this case. So let's do step one. So how's this gonna work? So what I will do is start with some element in the, element in the Brouwer group 
it lies in some piece of Cato's filtration. So say it lays in the nth piece for n at least one. What I'm going to do is I'll take the refined swan conductor at level n of that element. It's some alpha comma beta. I want to show that actually it is zero because then Remember, the kernel of the refined swan conductor will be fill n minus 1. So then I will have shown that a, which a priori was in fill n, actually has to be in fill n minus 1. And I can carry on repeating this inductively until I get everything into fill 0. You know, if everything in fill n is actually in fill n minus 1 for any n at least 1, I'll force everything into fill 0. OK, so... Um, so alpha comma beta, right? This alpha was a two form and beta was a one form on the special fiber, a global one form on the special fiber. So these two pieces of notation mean the same thing. But then remember that P is not in S and our fourth set of primes in S were all of the primes for which uh, these um, global one forms were non-zero. So since P is not in S, this is actually zero and hence beta is zero. Okay, we're halfway there. We wanted to get zero, zero. We got beta equals zero. That was easy. Okay, it remains to show that alpha is also zero. So then we use um, Cato's relation, n alpha equals d beta. Okay, if P doesn't divide n, it's also very easy. Beta is zero implies d beta is zero. And uh, then n alpha is zero, but uh, in characteristic p, if p doesn't divide n, we can deduce that alpha equals zero and we're happy. Okay, now we use that we included into S all the primes for which um, the absolute ramification index was at least p minus one. Mm -hmm. So we're now outside S. We have e less than p minus one and that implies that some uh number e prime which is kind of an important number in uh Curtis filtration is less than p okay but that means that p doesn't divide n for all n up to including this e prime So the only remaining case is when n is greater than e prime and p divides n. Because if p doesn't divide n, we're already done. So in this case, what we did was we've got our element a in the Brouwer group and we can multiply it by p. This lands us in fill n minus e. So we show that we land in fill n minus e of the Brouwer group. So we've really gone down. And we calculate the refined swan conductor at level n minus e of this element, p times a. And we essentially recover alpha and beta. So remember that e here is um, the ramification index. So p divided by pi to the e is just some unit, which is kind of harmless. So we got alpha and beta just scaled by some some unit. But now we can use our relation again. So now we're taking the refined swan conductor at level n minus e. So our relation is n minus e times the first entry is d of the second entry. So that's this unit times d beta. We already know that beta is zero. So and p over pi to the e is just a unit. So as soon as we know that p doesn't divide n minus e, we can deduce that alpha is zero. But OK, we're assuming that p divides n. And we know that e is less than p minus 1, and at least 1, it's a ramification index. That means p doesn't divide n minus e. So that's the sketch of the proof of step one. And I think I have enough time to say something about step two. So we crush everything into fill zero. So everything is now 
um, in the part of the filtration, of Cartis filtration, where the residue map is defined. So our evaluation map is going to factor via the residue map. We want to show that everything has constant evaluation. So uh, Collier, Tillen, and Skorobogat have already dealt with the case of elements of order coprime to P. So we only need to deal with uh, elements of order of power of P. OK, and I've said that the evaluation map factors through the residue map. So a priori, that takes uh, values in H1 of the special fiber. But the hochschild sayer spectral sequence um, gives a short exact sequence as follows. So here we've got H1 of the um, of uh, the residue fields. So this is just this finite field over which Y is defined. So these are the, the constant things. And we want to uh, show that our residue map lands in this constant part. On the right-hand side, we've got H1 of... Um, y bar, so that's um, the base change of y to an algebraic closure um, of f. Okay, and now here we actually use um, the assumption that the geometric Picard group is torsion free. So that shows that <clears throat> for x, um, h1 of x bar with the coefficients of z mod p to the r is zero. There's no torsion in the geometric Picard group. Okay, with some work, this implies that um, H1 of Y bar with coefficients in Z mod P to the I is zero. And hence, <clears throat> this short exact sequence is just an isomorphism um, between uh, H1 of Y, where we know we land a priori, and the constants, which is where we wanted to land. So that means the evaluation map since it factors through this residue map, which is constant, the evaluation map has to be constant. Okay, um, that's all I had to say. Thank you very much for your attention.